Good morning, Shepherd of the Valley. How are we today? (laughs) Woo! 945 service. Here we go. We want to welcome those who are listening and watching online as well. Can we give a clap offering for them? Who knows? All million of them listening around the world. Hey, we're so excited, man. Sometimes I just take the stage and I'm like, okay, what opening line do I want to give? You ever have a moment like that? No, you don't. Okay, so... Uh, We're in this series called In Blank As It Is in Heaven, and really what we're doing is we're looking at Jesus, what was central to his teaching, and he taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I don't know about you, but these words heaven and kingdom uh, are somewhat foreign. I know we use them, but maybe I think sometimes we almost misuse them. And so what we're trying to do in this series is really come back to what's center to Jesus and what's central to being followers of Jesus. So whether you're a follower of Jesus or considering following Jesus, I'm so glad you decided to show up today because we're going to talk about what's so central to being Christ's followers. Before we go any further, would you pray with me and we'll have a good old time at church. Jesus, we thank you for these moments that we share. And as the clock ticks, uh, we've got a lot to get to, Lord, but I pray that you help us get to where you want to go. Open up our hearts to receive what you would have for each and every one of us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I begin with a premise today. Backstories help us understand the full story. Let me say it again. Backstories help us understand the full story. If you've noticed within movies, within the last decade, prequels are just like the craze. You know, like a movie that was epic, then we write movies that kind of prelude the actual movie. Do you know what I'm saying? That's in fact what a prequel is. One of my favorites, of course, is the Star Wars films. Anybody Star Wars fans out there? Okay, like 10% of us. That's all right. That's all right. I remember watching them as a younger kid, you know, the 1970s original films, four, five, and six, and in number five, at the end of the movie, there's this famous line, Darth Vader says, Luke, I am your father, and I was like, whoa, I think I know what that means, that's cool, but it was like, hmm, interesting, but it wasn't, I know there's all sorts of controversy, the prequels, no one likes them, but it it, it became more real to me when I saw episode three, and I realized that Anakin Skywalker was Darth Vader, and Darth Vader used to be a good guy, and then he became a bad guy. And then, so then you fast forward to episode five when Luke says, I'm, when Darth Vader says, Luke, I am your father, there's this tension, because is Luke gonna go bad like his father or not? How many of you know a backstory can help make a fuller story? Yes, following me so far. All the Star Wars lovers just love that moment Great. You can email me anytime if you don't if you don't like what I say at C Huntley at SOV.church. <laughs> Let's say it together, Chuntley at SOV.church. I look forward to your emails. <laughs> but so often in church, I love that joke every time. <laughs> but so often in church, we start with the centerpiece that is Jesus, and we talk about what he, uh, he said and what he taught in church. And we should, because for those of us in the room, that's why we gather. But if we're not careful, we will forget that that main story has a backstory. And if we could understand the backstory, it'll bring, Lord willing, more meaning to the story of God and the story of Jesus and how it intersects with our lives. Does that make sense? So we're in this series called Blank As It Is In Heaven, and we've been talking about what is the kingdom and what is heaven, and last week, Pastor Jeremy talked about what is the kingdom. It's anywhere the king reigns, anywhere the king reigns, and today I want to bring attention to where is the kingdom? Where is heaven? Those words are kind of synonymous within scripture, and sometimes our idea of heaven and earth is kind of like this. It's these separate entities, that heaven is somewhere 
someday. And we see moments of this in scripture where Jesus is hanging on the cross and he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. So there is biblical precedence for this. But I wanna not start today, I wanna start with the backstory. And the backstory begins in the Garden of Eden. And so there's so much controversy about Genesis 1, 2, and 3. I'm gonna clean it up today. Just <laughs> I'm gonna clean up all the controversy up in about 20 minutes. Here we go. No, I don't think so. But I want you to catch this, that we get so tied up into the creation narrative that we miss the big premise. Genesis 1 and 2, in the beginning God created and he spoke. And this beautiful poem tells us time and time again, it was good, and it was good, and it was good. And the Bible writers, God wanted us to understand in a Genesis 1 and 2 world, in the Garden of Eden, there was no separation between heaven and earth. These two realities, in fact, overlapped. Isn't that amazing? And maybe you haven't even thought of that before, but there was no brokenness between God and humans. There was no brokenness between humans and humans. And there was no brokenness between humans, a created being, and the other elements of creation. It was beautiful, and it was just as God said it ought to be. But you know and I know, and almost that's maybe unfathomable to consider because we don't live in a Genesis 1 and 2 world. We don't live in this perfected wholeness in 2019 but we do in fact live in a Genesis 3 kind of world. And so that narrative in Genesis chapter three with Adam and this apple is just this narrative to tell us and to show us that humans chose to seize autonomy for themselves. They chose to decide apart from God what goodness and wholeness would be and what happened. It fractured what God had intended this world to be. And so now as we stand in 2019, no longer in Genesis 1 and 2, we see that there's sin and injustice and ugliness where God had anticipated for his presence, his goodness, his justice, and his beauty to reign. And there's so many people, particularly millennials and Gen Z coming up the ranks, where they cannot comprehend and understand a world of Genesis 3 and instead of moving towards the heart of God, they move away thinking this world is messed up. And I don't get how God could be a part of this if he did exist. And maybe you have had an experience where you've experienced significant brokenness or significant injustice, and you're like, how could this be? Genesis 3 to 11 show us, if you, sh- if you spend time reading that, an unveiling, an unraveling of humans as they begin and uh, just attempt to do life their way. And it becomes worse and worse of a problem. But God was not content with leaving us to our problem and our injustice. He had a plan. And in Genesis 12, we see that God's plan was to raise up a nation that would follow him, that would listen to his ways, and that there would be moments that heaven and earth could intersect once again as God introduced this idea called the tabernacle. The tabernacle was this option, this possibility for heaven to intersect earth, which sounds so old school for us, but you can understand how God meets his people right where they are, where their understanding of deities was deities of locations and physical places, you see. So God is not limited to this tabernacle, but in order to move where his people are, he sets up this process where God's people could intersect heaven in the presence of God in this tabernacle. And then as the narrative of the Bible continues, uh, God allows not David, but his son Solomon to build this temple, which is just a fancy tabernacle where his people could intersect earth. Heaven could intersect earth for a moment in time, for a place in time. And wouldn't you know that they decorated the tabernacle and the temple, what? 
with symbols that would bring them back to the garden. Genesis 1 and 2, the hot spot, the place where God's presence would be. And so many of you know that this plan for redemption through God's people, it went awry and it went amok. And so Jesus, uh, God sends his son, the embodiment of his presence in the form of Jesus to come to this earth, to intersect earth. And if you have your Bibles, I want to just read a passage, uh, John chapter 1, that's the Gospel of John 8, 62, if my memory serves me right, in your pew Bibles. A few weeks ago, I preached, and I called it the hymn Bible, uh, which doesn't make any sense. You can always call me out when I say things that are weird. Um, <laughs> John chapter 1, 862. John was a follower of Jesus, and this is how he chooses to describe to the world who Jesus is. He puts pen to paper, so to speak, and what does he say in John chapter 1, verse 1? In the beginning, pause right there. John wants his readers, he wants you and I to see that he's bringing them back to the beginning, a new kind of Genesis 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now what does it say there? In the beginning was the Word. The Word has now become flesh in the person of Jesus. Look at verse 14. And verse 14 says that they, uh, the Word became flesh. As Jesus became human and he what did the word, what did it say there? It dwelt, does yours say dwelt? Lived or dwelt, what? I can't hear you. Lived among them. And that word lived or dwelt among them is this Greek word that means tabernacled. John does not mince words, people. I don't even know if I said that right. He is choosing his words very carefully. What? The word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us? What is he saying? He's saying what was once a place, the tabernacle or the temple, is now a person. God's presence is no longer limited to a specific time and place where earth and heaven could intersect. But because of Jesus, full of grace and truth, full uh, fully man and fully God, comes to this earth. And what is his announcement? The kingdom of heaven is here. The kingdom of heaven is near. And what he's saying is he's pointing to himself and he's saying the full presence of God the Almighty lives inside of me. And guess what he chooses to do? Because the kingdom of heaven, because heaven in itself lives inside of him, he has, in fact, these keys to the kingdom. And so wherever he goes, heaven goes. Do you follow me? And so he taught in ways that pointed to himself as bringing heaven to earth. He announced good news. He befriended the outsiders, and he unlocked heaven. He physically healed people, people who could not walk, people who had leprosy or a skin disease, and by his touch, he did not get sick, but he brought healing. He unlocked heaven, wholeness, justice to those people. Heaven was, in fact, in his hands. He had the keys to the kingdom of heaven. One time, there's this guy named Lazarus, and he's deader than a doornail. Three days, he stinks. The, the King James says he stinketh, okay? But Jesus holds the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and he says, Lazarus, come out. And with his words of life, dead things come to life. Why? Because he is God and a body, and wherever he goes, heaven goes, and he unlocked heaven wherever he went. It was not only showing them what heaven was like, but heaven had opposition. And heaven was offensive to those who loved hate. Heaven was offensive for the, those who loved injustice. Heaven was offensive for those who had a different idea of what God was like. And so people attacked him. 
and they took his life, thinking that they were crushing him. But the author of life can't die. He holds the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And three days again, he rises. Come on. And he is called the resurrection of the life, proving to the whole universe that he was in fact God in a body because nothing could hold him back from what he was meant to do. Bring heaven back. And in his teachings, he wants you to do the same. He's having this moment and he asks the disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. He's having this small glimpse of heaven is in this person. And, and Jesus says, you are right. And what he says next, he says, he, uh, fast forward one of the things he said, he says, I will build my church on that statement. Peter, you are the rock. I'm not building myself on you, I'm building myself as the cornerstone. But upon your claim that I am the son of the living God, you are building on me. And that's why we have that text in Ephesians chapter two today, because all those of us who say yes to him have heaven inside of us, and we, church, are what God is building as stones to be the presence where God lives by his Holy Spirit. So these are just moments that we share together, but heaven is not confined to this place, it's inside of us. And so what Jesus does is he gives you and I the keys to the kingdom, and he says, go bring heaven back. Go bring heaven wherever you go. Go bring peace, go bring justice, go bring self-sacrificial love. That is what he hands us, church. Heaven is not somewhere, someday. Heaven is here. For all those who say yes to him, you have the presence of heaven inside of you. You have the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And if we only fast forward time and time again to Jesus, then we might miss the fullness of this narrative that is God saw a world in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and he showed us that how it ought and ought not be. And he brings himself to show us perfectly what heaven's like so that you and I could join him in his mission. Heaven's right here. It's not just somewhere someday, it's right here. So what does that mean for us today? Heaven, first of all, heaven is wherever God's ought to be becomes our reality. Genesis 1 and 2 is this, this amazing picture of how the world ought to be. Heaven is wherever God's ought to be, his life, the way he designed it to be, with beauty, wholeness, justice, hope, goodness. That's where heaven is. That's where heaven is. And if you're in this place today and you can identify how the world ought not be, then you're one step closer to bringing heaven to that place. One, a great example of this kind of living is our friend John Tolo. John Tolo moved him and his family to Frogtown because he saw a world that ought not be. He saw a world where there was intense crime, intense drug use, there were uh, rundown buildings everywhere. And he saw a world that ought not be. And he moved his family to that location and he brought people with him to bring heaven back, to bring wholeness and justice back to that place. So you hear today about these fishing escapade that our church gets to participate in, right? What is all that all about? It's John and his team noticing something that ought not be. He noticed young people and 
officers being in contention, in tension, not trusting each other. And he said, that ought not be. Why would young people be afraid of policemen? And perhaps, why would policemen and women be afraid of young people? And so this entire event was him noticing what ought not be and putting young people and officers in a boat so they realize that the same blood in each of them flows, that they're both human, that they both have joys and struggles in life. Why do we do the event? Is a whole bunch of people gonna say yes to Jesus? I don't know. But when we bring a little bit of heaven and a little bit of justice and a little bit of truth and a little bit of joy, heaven's there. It's how something ought not to be becomes how it ought to be again. When I was 15 years old, I looked out and I realized God was asking me to be a part of, of helping young people see their potential. Because no young student, no teenager should ought to be alone in this planet. No teenager ought to not know that God has a plan and a purpose for their life. No teenager should ought know that God completely loves them. Regardless of if they change one behavior or change the way they believe that God loves them. And so that was my campaign for seven plus years at this church. And then something began to stir inside of me where I realized that students would be whole and they would get forgiveness and they would get God inside of them that would change everything. But then they would go back to family situations that was less than God's way and how he wanted a family unit to interact. And I said, that ought not be. So you, on the outside, you might say, Sam, it makes sense. You got your seminary degree, you're moving up the ladder. I'm here to tell you today, friends, I'm not changing my job description because, well, because I can't do that. <laughs> That's like big dogs gonna do that. But, um, but I got the opportunity to change what I do, not because I'm trying to get more power or get more people to, you know, whatever, whatever. It's because my ought to be is changing. And I see my role as a way to participate, not with just students, but the entire family, to see them come to know Jesus and have their whole lives changed. It's an ought to be that changed it. What's your ought and what's your ought not? Where does your heart break? That's where you should be stepping into. Heaven is where God says it ought, ought, ought not to be, and also heaven is wherever we choose to unlock it. Heaven, and I close with this, is where we choose to unlock it. He gives you and I the keys to the kingdom. And he says, you know what? All the love, all the grace, all the self-sacrifice that I've given you as I gave my life on the cross, I give to you. Go. Bring heaven back. Heaven is wherever we choose, my friends, to take what God has done for us into our neighborhoods, into our workplaces, and we choose to unlock it. Silly example of this. Um, my wife forgot her shoes at our local workout place. And so she asked me to go get them. Well, I don't work out there. So I said, fine, I'll go get the shoes, but give me your keys. She gives me your keys. I go up to the door, and, uh, and there's no scanner, right? You have the little card. I'm like, okay, that's weird. I don't know. And so I'm fumbling through all the keys, and I'm trying every single one of them to try to unlock this door. And it's getting a little bit embarrassing as I'm going like, okay, this is my house key, but I'm desperate here, you know? <laughs> and people are watching me, and it's just awkward. They're inside. I'm not. I'm like, <laughs> and then I realized I was just at the wrong door. But what does a key do? Key unlocks things. Keys give us access. When Jesus says to Peter and he says to his followers, I give you the keys, he's giving you and I the access to open any door he calls us to. This is our call, church. 
It's when, it's when the student notices the outsider and they choose to stay with them. They choose to stick up for them. It's for the business person in here who decides that you're going to do business only the ethical way. It's for the retired person in here who sees that God is inviting you to a new mission for him, not just to go on an unending vacation. It's for the mom in here who's experienced the extreme pain and loss of a miscarriage. And rather than hanging on to that hurt and that pain, you see that God is, will use that as a way to support and love someone else going through the same. Heaven is wherever we unlock it. It's for men in the room who choose to share weakness and struggle that you're going through because that's the way the kingdom works. This is how we unlock heaven. We engage with what it ought not be and in Jesus' name bring heaven back. So what's your ought or what's your ought not? Because that will be the thing that will drive you to join us. Where is heaven? It's where God's kingdom comes and his will is done. Would you join us in thinking about how you can make heaven come to life in your workplace, your neighborhood, or wherever God calls you? There's a lot more light bulbs that need to be turned on, but much more importantly, the world is awfully dark and could use some more light. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for these moments that we share, and I thank you for this amazing narrative that you have been writing with our lives and throughout history. May we see that we're a part of this amazing story of bringing heaven back. May we notice the places that ought not to be, and by the power of Jesus inside of us, may we bring heaven to those places. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. And the pinnacle moment of that is...